This episode of The Anxious Truth is brought to you by me, because I'm not just a podcaster, I'm also an author. I've written several useful books on anxiety and anxiety recovery, and I know you're going to find them helpful. You can find them on my website at theanxioustruth.com. This episode of... Hey, what up, everybody? Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode number 182. Welcome back to the program. Welcome back to the show. I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of this fine podcast, or what I, <clears throat> excuse me, what I hope you will think is a fine podcast. Today, we are going to tackle a subject that I know many of you are interested in. Now, this is not necessarily directly related to anxiety and anxiety recovery, but sometimes in this journey, we just need to hear an inspiring story, an uplifting story, an encouraging story from a superior human being. And I absolutely have that person waiting in the green room. We have a green room. We're very fancy here. Waiting in the green room right now. I'm going to bring out my new friend, Jessica Seidner. Jessica is a perfect example of somebody who was forced to navigate when, when you guys ask me all the time, but what happens when there's a real medical issue or what happens when there's a real life problem? What happens when there's grief? What happens when they're lost? Jessica was forced by life, this ridiculous thing we call life, to navigate through two tremendous real challenges at the same time. So we're going to talk about how she was able to navigate through real grief, real loss, real depression, real fear, real uncertainty, medical issues, all of this stuff all at the same time and come out at the other end. Not only OK, but at least from where I'm sitting, thriving. So let us bring Jessica Seidner on now from the famous green room. Hey, Jess, what up? Hello. I love the green room. It was great. <laughs> how, are the, how are the hors d'oeuvres? I haven't tested them yet. Fantastic. Just sparkling water next time. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Green M&Ms only. Jess is like right, very, right. She's very hard to please. So, uh, anyway, Jessica Seidner. Jess has been through. Jessica, Jess, do you have a preference? Whatever you want. I have some people who call me Jessica, Jesse, and Jess. Whatever. I'll what? answer to just about anything. <laughs> Don't call me late for dinner. So uh, <laughs> Jessica, as I mentioned in the intro, just an inspiring human being. And thank you for taking the time to come and share your story. So oh we're talking to an audience full of people who are navigating their problems as it is with anxiety and anxiety recovery. And then all sometimes life throws additional monkey wrenches in as if agoraphobia or panic disorder or OCD aren't enough. Other things happen. There's loss, there's medical problems, there's health problems. Tell us what you had to navigate through in a very short amount of time. Well, I will tell you that your introduction was great. It was very thorough. And I would say just in two words, hot mess. Like that was me for quite some time. And, you know, it's funny because you think, gosh, I'm going through this and this and this. Surely there's a list somewhere and I've like maxed out. And then another wrench gets thrown in. And I know that many of your, your listeners and viewers have felt that. Um, long story short, I had the dream marriage, married to the dream guy. His name was Tyler. And he was just, he was the life of the party. Everyone wanted to be around him. He was so wise and spiritual. He was just, he was just a light. And little did I know that he was battling with depression. And I didn't realize the extent of it until one day he left for work and he never came home. Hmm. He never came home. Yeah. And um, so here I am at that point, 36 years old. And, you know, now when I see, I don't know, signs on the highway saying missing person or on the news, missing person before I just, you know, that that's a shame, but I couldn't relate to it. Now I know what it feels like to have experience when your partner, when your spouse with the, when the love of your life is missing, literally missing. So he was missing for 24 hours and, um, through a lot of research and um, rummaging through things and trying to figure out what the heck happened, working with detectives, all of that good stuff, we finally um, did find the suicide note. And I'll never forget when it happened because it was truly an out of body experience. I mean, I could, I, it was like I was watching a movie and it was all in slow motion. And, um, and that was the moment where my life completely changed. At the age of 36, I became a widow to someone who had 
battled such internal demons and just, and what's so interesting is he had a heart to serve. He loved serving people. He loved taking care of people, but he was living in a way that he just couldn't live anymore and um, feeling isolated. And, and that was the, that was the beginning of, I would say, if I look back in my life, I would say I've had bouts of depression and anxiety and all of all of that stuff, you know, through, throughout my life. But that was the first time that, uh, I mean, my life was changed. And really, I was kind of out of body um, for months after his, his death. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it was just in a, in a snapshot, right? Like it just was that quick. Yeah. everything changed. So you are instantaneously immersed in this pit of loss and grief and so many different emotions. I cannot even imagine how many, you know, we have the capability of experiencing such a tremendous broad range of emotion. I got to believe an event like that makes you experience almost all of them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All of them at once, including, I mean, you go through, you know, I think when they describe the grief cycle, it's like this, like, really nice circular thing you know <laughs> like like it's like you start here and then you go here and then you go here they don't necessarily say it goes like this and then this and then up and down i mean it is nuts to the degree of i, I i'm gonna share a story of how i mean obviously i went through all the stages of grief over and over again i still do that right but i I, I was trying to get a hold, this was like 24 hours or 48 hours after he died, maybe even a week. I was trying to get a hold of my family who were kind of all on call. So I called, you know, I called my mom. She didn't answer her phone. I called my sisters. They didn't answer their phone. I called my dad. They didn't answer their phone. I called, I, I mean, I called everyone and they just didn't answer. And I literally had it in my head. And I don't know why that something horrific had happened to my father and they were going to, they were not answering because they did not know how to tell me. So your brain just, your brain just does so many tricky things and yet it does beautiful things too, yeah. to protect you and to get you through, um, through those times. I mean, for years I would wake up every morning and I would think that was the worst nightmare of my life. And then I would realize it wasn't, it wasn't a nightmare. It yeah. it's my life. And how do I keep going? Yeah. So, so much of this, and you know, it's interesting how you say you had that thought that something, and I'm sure it felt very real. Something happened to your dad and they oh. weren't going to tell you because they felt they couldn't, you couldn't handle it. And when we are under duress, you know, we become a little less resilient and those sort of thoughts are more likely to pop up and mm -hmm. be sticky and be really powerful. So I'm sure you move through a lot of that stuff. Did you find as you're confronting this, this tidal wave, an unrelenting churning, like you're, you're basically in a food processor of emotions at that point. I like how you say, it's not the nice little diagram, the grief cycle. It's literally like, it's, it's a food processor. You're just kind of- It is a food processer. It makes like mush. Yeah, <laughs> as you were, so now you're navigating through some of the heaviest emotions that a human being can, can experience, of course, and they're coming at you in rapid succession. And so much of my audience is, so many people in the audience are concerned with big emotions. They are afraid of them. They can't, they think they're going to be too much. When did you ever find that you're, you felt like that's it. It's too much. You must've had those moments and what got you through those moments. Gosh, good question. You know, I've had, I've had so many of those moments. Um, the biggest one being, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes, but my breast cancer diagnosis that came six months later, like literally I thought I was going to, like pound my head against like something like brain matter was going to fly because yeah. I just could not believe what shitty luck I had. I just yeah. couldn't believe it. And yeah, so those moments, um, they come in waves. They're not predictable. Um, but what I also would say is people are stronger than they realize that they are, right? So you, you may not think right now that you're strong enough to deal with X, Y, and Z. And when things happen, because unfortunately, like you said, life just happens to all of us. It just, it just is the way it is. Um, it, it's interesting because you realize in those moments, like I can do this. You've got that like internal grit, that determination that comes out, right? And I would say, first of all, it's really about taking the baby steps. It's all about moving forward 
honoring the past, honoring where you are, but taking baby steps forward. So, you know, um, I, I would, and I found this to be helpful. Of course, I love therapy and I have gone since um, the day after essentially Tyler died. And one of the things that I've learned that's really helpful even today, because I think, first of all, I would say grief takes all shapes and forms. So you could have grief related to a loss, um, a, a loved one that you've lost, who you've lost. You could have grief because you've had COVID and now maybe you have some like residual effects. You could be grieving because you're an empty nester. You could be grieving because um, your, your mental and your physical and or your physical health is not the same and it's not as stable. Grief takes tons and tons of forms and it lasts a long time. It just evolves differently. And in many ways it can be hard, but it can also feel good if you let it feel good, like give you a passion to do good. Right. Um, but one of the things that I still do because I'm still grieving and I still have triggers and I still have weird things that, you know, I know come from that trauma is do kind of a morning self-assessment right? Whether it's while you're drinking your coffee or if you're doing meditation, like how am I today emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually? And if you're feeling like a shit show, adjust your calendar to reflect, I'm not in the mood. I need to do some self-care today. That's my priority. And I've got people in my life who either understand it or who don't understand it. And if they don't understand it, maybe they don't need to be in your life. What's so that's like a couple tips. Yeah, which are really good tips. The baby step tip is is spectacular. It's really good. And it's something we talk about in my community all the time. Every little mm -hmm. step matters, right? So yes. I want to talk about two things there. And then I want to move on to the second half of this like horror show, uh, yeah. which you've already, you know, mentioned, and we'll get into that. So baby steps, so important. I want to talk about the lessons that you were able to learn really from day to day. Like, so we could talk about, look back at, at the micro level, at the large level and say, oh, this is what I learned. And this is, I found my strength and I, and I turned it loss into this. And, but day to day, one of the things we talked about in the community all the time is you are proof every day. So when you wake up on Tuesday and it is, you feel like you just cannot do this day. I cannot do this anymore. It's overwhelming. You can look back at Monday and say, well, I felt that way yesterday too, but I did Monday. Did you ever, did that ever dawn on you? The lessons that you took from day to day to day, like I made it through a day, so I guess I can make it through another one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you have to be able to look back and reflect on those. I'm going to use the word achievements, which usually coincides with, coincides with something large, right? But mm -hmm. achievements can be small. Yeah. And you do you do look back the day before and you kind of, it's like a building block, right? It's sort of a, a mixture between, I did it once, I can do it again. I, you know, even if it was a small achievement, I was able to do it. And then the next day, it, it kind of like, I know this sounds really wild, but I would be like lying in bed. And of course I'd go through this, this is a nightmare. No, this nightmare is my life. And I would think, okay, swing my legs around and stand up. Okay. You know, like I would, it would be that, it would be that intentional, yeah. but also recognizing and being okay. I mean, I think with the fact, because I'm kind of a go-getter and a busy body that what was most productive during that time frame was to swing my legs over and take the over my bed and take that first step and then maybe do some meditation right. and maybe make coffee and maybe that's all I could do that yeah, day. Yeah, but that counts. That's okay. It counted. It's funny because you said like, you know, sometimes you'll have to decide, well, today self-care is one of those, it's a little bit of a hot button in the community that I'm serving because yep. we have to be careful to not say that self-care is retreating from from some of these mm -hmm. fears. However, but you're you're so dead on with this. Sometimes self-care is literally just being able to get up and feed yourself and shower and comb your hair and put something on. And that's right. a, that that counts that day. It is it, it is so true because what I think and I agree I think self-care can be um kind of obnoxiously used, right? You kind of sometimes think, "Oh, it's like a spa day or a retreat." <laughs> right, and right. Sometimes what what I have um, you know, my life now, five years later, so much of it is rooted in serving and caring for others, which I feel like is a great way to honor Tyler because that's how he was. Mm -hmm. But that's my form of self-care is actually getting out, 
starting the conversations, talking about suicide, talking about depression, talking about my own anxiety and my own struggles, talking about breast cancer, talking about the things that people don't want to talk, talk about for whatever reason can be very, um, can like warm my heart and warm my soul. And it almost gives purpose to what I went through. Yeah. Excellent. So there you go. It's sometimes it's just day to day and learning the lesson of, Hey, look, I got up and I can get up again and the yeah. small things. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about part two of the horror show. So yeah, the horror season, show six months later, boom, you have another bombshell bombshell. In fact, it was the day after I finally felt like, Oh my gosh, I came out of this fog. I was in a fog for six months and I was at an event and I'm like, I'm awake. I'm awake. I'm starting to feel things. I'm seeing things again. And it was a really great feeling. And that next morning um, here in Denver, they would do a promotion on one of the news stations to remind people to do breast self exams. And they called it Buddy Check Nine. It was really a great, great campaign that went on for years and years and years. And I've always ignored it because I was like, well, I don't need to worry about it. I'm 36. Like, I have no breast cancer in my family. I don't even know what a lump feels like. I don't know how to do a breast self exam. This does not pertain to me. But for some reason that morning I woke up and I saw and I thought, well, no one's been in my business because in my head it was Tyler's job, you know, to do to to to, to let me know if there was something going on with my breasts, right? I mean, just to be honest with you, no, I'm the only person who thinks that, right? I'm sure you're not. I'm sure you're not the only person who thought that. I mean, did I communicate that with him? No, but that's what I thought. So you know, he he has died, and I'm like, well, nobody's been up in my business, so maybe I better do a breast self exam. And I know I had no idea what I was doing, and with three within about three seconds in the shower. I found a lump and all of a sudden like the flags went flying, you know, your gut flags. And yeah. I thought, Oh my God, this is not good. And I called my healthcare provider. I made a, an appointment and I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So I detected it incredibly early and I'm so thankful for that. I mean, I feel like it's such a miracle, but I will tell you as I went through that journey, um, it occurred to me that people who, you know, are all into wellness and watching their carbs and working out and they, you know, they do the right things health wise. There's a whole bunch of people just like us, just like the viewers and the listeners who just had no idea what to do when it came to the health of their breasts. So they're asking me, what, what does the mammogram feel like? How did you do it? What, how do you do a breast health exam? What did the lump feel like? And I'm thinking, okay, this does not make any sense. Like, what's where where is there a gap here because we all have these questions and really we're of age to be paying attention i mean 40 is nice but really you should be yeah. in your 20s and 30s too so i thought about it a little bit more and it honestly all came down to the idea of a paper gown if you really you know think about it i know um a lot of your viewers can recognize the feeling of a paper gown you're in a paper gown and that's the only time that you're getting a breast self exam from your doctor's office or your healthcare provider and usually when you're wearing your paper gown i mean as fashionable as they are no, oh yeah yeah right <laughs> you Everybody know usually you're right exactly they're really not not fashionable and not comfortable you're thinking I don't want to learn how to do a breast self exam. I don't want to ask any questions. I just want to get the heck out of this paper gown and get on with my life. So yep. that's where I thought about how can we create a space and an environment that exudes comfort, exudes conversation, connection, warmth, everything you think about when you're not thinking about a clinical environment where yep. people can actually learn in a place that's comfortable for them about the ins and outs of early breast cancer detection. So that's how I originally started my business called Night Out with the Girls. Um, and it's the girls refer to the girls, but we've evolved. <laughs> I, have, I have a lot of double entendres. I mean, don't yeah. get me started. Like, you know, don't even, don't even get me started there, but really, and why I think this put is, your, put, oh, your go ahead. put your nails up to the camera. Oh yeah. Well, these ones are better. So I I'm always have watching on Spotify or YouTube. <laughs> Seriously. Little boobs. Yeah. I, so you really do like you are on brand all the time, which I, I so appreciate. Before, I, I am. <laughs> let, let's get you to that point though. So now you have this diagnosis, which comes yeah. out of the blue. You're not thinking about it in any way. And now, and I want to end this to make sure we, we tell people what you turned it into, which is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now there is 
a real health concern, actual real health concern, and just a ton of uncertainty and vulnerability and fear and all of those things. Same thing. Now you have to navigate through those again. How did you manage to not live? So now you just have to live day to day because you don't know what's going to happen. You have tests, you have assessments to do, mm -hmm. you have whatever treatment that you went through. At some point, we will all jump ahead. I'm going to jump ahead a year and a half down the road to my own funeral. Did that happen to you? And how did you deal with that? How did you how did you not get caught in that? Oh my heavens, yes. It completely, I completely jumped ahead. Um, I mean, to the degree I, I just I figured this this was it. When you hear breast cancer, your mind goes to the worst. And I think that's very, very common. You know, how many months do I have to live? You see it everywhere, and you it it is it is horrific. And then on top of it, still in the middle of the grief process of losing Tyler. Right. Um, so what I, I did was, and I don't think that I intentionally did this, but I really, I got to a point that your brain and your emotions and your heart can only handle so much. Mm -hmm. So I kind of put a pause. I know this sounds really wild, but a pause right. on the Tyler suicide thing. Okay. Because I just couldn't, I, I had to focus now on my own life and right. how I was going to survive this and get the information and the data that I needed. But um, does that answer your question? It, it does. And I, I think the smart, so in other words, instead of you jumping forward and I'm going to, you know, you're writing a screenplay in your head about your own funeral and your own motel and what the worst case. And so many people that are listening and listening to us and watching us right now have that issue where even before there's an actual health concern, they're jumping ahead to what if there is. And then if there is, they're jumping right ahead to the end of the story, which is the catastrophic end of the story. So, I mean, when you started to establish, I don't know how soon it was in that after your diagnosis and during your treatment that you started to turn it into Night Out with the Girls and the Breast Education Center that you're doing now. Was that part of it? How did you stay in today? I have to deal with today. I have to, today I have to go to a treatment. Today I have a doctor's appointment. Today I have a meeting. Today I have dinner with my mom. Whatever it is, how did you stay in today and not in what the worst case would have been in a year and a half possibly? Well, and I'll say two things about that. So first of all, especially the listeners and the viewers who have all gone through so many different battles, so many different traumas, different, maybe different, maybe the same as me, but you know, you you, you remember like, hey, I've taken these baby steps. I've, take, I've had these achievements. I've made it work day to day to day. And so you have to remember that, like when you face another trial or situation or challenge, mm -hmm. like I've had it tough. I can do this. I can do this. But like the day to day, I would just honestly, um, I would let myself feel what I was feeling. I'd give myself grace. I surrounded myself not with people, but with the right people. Very so there was a big difference mm -hmm. there. And I didn't, um, I, I didn't jump so much to the fear of the funeral and the death and all of that because, it, and it was easy to, but I felt like that would just cause a giant spiral. Yeah. I mean, I have I, like I have had the moments where I am screaming. Yeah. I'm I've had the moments where I am, you know, hysterical. I I mean, I won't go into the situation. I'm still afraid to go to my mailbox sometimes, which sounds yeah. kind of wild. I know I'm speaking with no. a very safe group here, yeah. Yeah. and yeah, I I mean, it was messy, but I learned to sit in the mess. I learned to invite the right people into the mess. And I learned to give myself grace when it felt like I just wasn't moving forward at right. all. It's, a, it's so interesting. And you know, I would not expect you to be a listener of this podcast. Thankfully, you don't have to be which is great. But your what the words that you're using the terms, the phrases, your the way that you handle and navigated these, they are 100%. Anybody listening is going to say, Oh, that sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. And this is coming from somebody who does not necessarily have or maybe you do, I don't know, have a diagnosed anxiety disorder. So isn't it amazing how the same principles apply even in life. So even when there is two giant monkey wrenches thrown into to your works, you still use the same principles one day at a time, allow yourself to feel what you need to feel, let it be there, get the support you need, take care of yourself, even in baby steps. These are all 
you are the embodiment of everything that my audience is trying to do just without maybe necessarily their particular problem. So very inspiring. Well, I love that. And it's really, you know, in talking, engaging in this podcast, podcast, engaging with your community, I think bringing the ick to light, bringing the ickiness, yeah. the, the nastiness, the hot messness of your life to light, I think it, that's just one simple thing that, that we can all do to yeah. feel more connected and less isolated. So conversations with friends and family and, you know, you know who those people are. We, we In the breast world, we call them your breast buddy. <laughs> You were just full of these. Let's so the moral of the story here in the end is not only are we able to navigate through the most difficult of times, right? You've always you've gotten through every challenge you've ever faced. If you're listening, you have actually gotten through every challenge you've ever faced. So, but not only can we just be okay, in, in Jessica's case, you could even I'm gonna say from where I sit as, as as a friend of yours, like better than okay. So let's talk about what you turn this into because. It's tremendous. Go ahead. Let's hear it. What did you okay. make? Okay. Okay. Well, I, yes, it can be okay. I will just reiterate that. And yes, it seems like I'm all about breasts because I am. I mean, they're on my nails. I carry a fake one around. Oh, it just, I'm, yeah, all about the breasts. has to be around that. Okay. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it, everything that I do is really centered about uh, around one concept, which I really think that the audience will it will resonate with them. Is yeah. I believe that if we can increase connection between each other about that stuff that is icky, right? If we can in increase connection, we are going to decrease those feelings of isolation, which mm -hmm. we all know can be debilitating and paralyzing and shaming and guilt filled which we don't want. So if we can increase the connection between people, we decrease the feelings of isolation. And at the end of the day, we increase the action we need to take, whether big or small, um, yeah. taking those mental health um, baby steps or going as far as getting a, a, a breast mammogram if something doesn't seem right. So conceptually, that's what I'm all about. So. Yeah. Um, that that's sort of the core of everything that I do. But really, uh, night out with the girls. We're just a, we're a virtual wellness company, and we offer a virtual wellness um, early breast cancer detection program called the Breast Education. Wink, wink, because it's the best <laughs> education. Just, keep now, <laughs> just I know, I like keep the coming. I'm here, here for them. People are going to be like, don't, ugh, she's too cheesy. Um, it's all good. It's all good. So the breast education and what's so special about that is it is designed for everyone. So um, anyone who has breast tissue, we always say we are into you. We, everyone is welcome. And what we really do is give people the kind of breast health 101 on how and when to detect breast cancer early. And we do that through um, videos that we that, that feature our, I have a team of healthcare providers as well as breast cancer survivors. So you can hear all from them and it, their experiences are so rich. I've got downloadables, activities, conversation starters. So it's still very focused on that mm -hmm. connection, conversation and comfort. And we, you know, early detection is so important and it needs to be like, we're in breast cancer awareness month, that's great. I appreciate it. It's important, but we need to move from awareness to action and breast cancer can happen outside of October. So really we focus on a few key things that I actually think would really relate to all the audience listening and tuning in today. Follow your gut. If something does not seem right physically with your breasts, emotionally, yeah. mentally, follow your gut and contact a healthcare provider. And the other main thing is take action when something doesn't seem right. So don't wait. As scary as it is, just make that phone call. And those are really two important things that I think pertains to just about anyone and everyone. And the third is, you know, bring the right people into your life. And I alluded to that. And we call those people your breast buddies. But who are those people who are going to listen without judgment? who are not going to be like, that's great that you're going through that. Let me tell you about my story. Who's going to be the, the people in your life who hold you to a healthy, loving, 
degree of accountability, that there's no shame and there's no guilt. So overall, that's what we focus on. And so we do this, um, the breast education is for um, the workplace. So employers um, can offer it to their employees, which is really special. And what an awesome way to demonstrate your to your employees that you like you care about them. You care about their physical health and their mental health because it's all connected, right? And we also offer it for individuals. I My goal is to never leave anyone out of having the opportunity to learn how to detect breast cancer early. Hell of a job. It's it's wonderful. And, and yeah. then, you know, I love it. I love talking about breasts and early detection. I'm not kidding. Everywhere I go, because what we want to do and what you're doing, Drew, and what I'm doing and what the, your community is doing is we are normalizing a conversation that needs to be had about very important topics. Yeah, I like so I've had you. trauma, you've had, we've all had things and we're oh. all going to be okay when we're together and we're talking about it, bringing it to light. I like how you've taken the, the conversation that needs to be had about breast health and taken it out of the paper gown environment and put it into an environment where you can actually have the conversation more comfortably, more organically, without a big light shining on you, be freezing your ass off. So I get Absolutely, that. yes. And we love our healthcare providers and our healthcare providers what? on our team actually get to learn from our participants. Like what, what can they do to better right. serve their patients? Tremendous, Jess, tremendous. I, I, I have tremendous amount of admiration and respect for what you've built out of tragedy, clearly. And, and pain and heartache and adversity. And you truly are a story of somebody who really made a useful thing out of that. So not only can we navigate through the nasties, the icky, the ick, as Jess yeah. says, but you can be okay and you can even thrive afterwards, which is for anybody who's dealing with the disorders that I'm talking about all the time and the problems, many, many people come through the other side of this and they do wind up thriving and positive stuff comes out of it. So Thank you, Jess. I appreciate you coming by. Absolutely. I have it up on the screen if you're watching Night Out with the Girls. It's nightoutwiththegirls.com. Uh -huh. Yep. So uh -huh. it's on the screen. Uh, but if you would like to find more about where to find Jess, I will have all of her links. Go to the slash 182 because it's episode number 182. I'll have all of Jess's links so you can get in touch with her. And that's it. You got questions or whatever. I will pass them along. Yes. Just to be willing to answer. Please, them. please. And it's been so great being with all of you virtually. And just know if you notice anything, if you've noticed anything that doesn't seem right with your breasts, I always tell people this may be the sign if you're tuning into this, that it's time for you to, to take action because yeah. getting the information is freeing. It is very freeing. Knowing is better than not knowing. Yes. Yes. Even when it's scary stuff. So yes. good job. Good job. All right, folks, I guess we're going to kind of wrap it up here. Um, appreciate you coming by as always. See you out with Afterglow by my buddy Ben Drake, as I usually do. You can find Ben online at bendrakemusic.com. And I'm going to ask a favor. If you are listening to the podcast on iTunes or any platform that lets you rate or review, then leave us a five-star rating if you dig it, and then take an extra 30 seconds and write a review so other people can find the podcast. Tell them how great Jess was, by the way. <laughs> they, they will want to know that. And that's it. Uh, what else can I tell you? If you're watching on YouTube, I think I'm supposed to say like and subscribe. I'm the worst influencer ever. Like, I'm never going to get an influencer card. But anyway, do it. Do all the things. Hit all the buttons. You guys know what to do. And uh, find all my stuff at theanxioustruth.com. I appreciate you guys coming by. Enjoy the music. We'll see you next week. And as I always say, this is the way. It's in these feelings that you never show. Yeah, y'all doing fine. It's all around you, you can breathe it in. And this is where your story begins. You got the feeling that you're gonna win.